All right, if you have your Bibles with you, we ask you to turn to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 24, and we're going to begin reading in verse 15. 2 Chronicles 24, beginning in verse 15, uh, the Bible says, But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel both toward God and toward his house. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. God, how it's been as a help and an only stabilizer in our life down through the years. And we praise you for that. God, we thank you for the ministry that you've given us here at Dover, Lord, and we pray that you continue to bless it, uh, make uh, make our church strong, uh, make us be a testimony to thy glory and thy honor. Lord, we pray that you bless the mission there at Paris, and there it would be, it would stand as an edifice just for you, Lord, and that you would be there to bless that group <clears throat> as, uh, as they continue to grow. God, we pray you bless your word to the hearts of the hearers, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, maybe not so familiar, familiar verses of Scripture, and we'll be looking at the lives and the ministry of a king and a priest that work together. And uh, that their, uh, their work, and they're both following the will of God, uh, the Lord God blessed tremendously. Now, if you don't get nothing else out of this message, remember this. If you work to be in the will of God, He will bless it. Now, immediately this fleshly mind thinks and equates blessing with financial gain, and that's never been true for God's people. In fact, He promised the opposite for us to be pilgrims and strangers. Uh, uh, you ever wonder why uh, Abraham never owned anything, any land? I mean, he had cows and stuff like that. Well, the reason why, it made him a pilgrim. When you put roots down, you're no longer a pilgrim. Yeah. And uh, so we see that as the Lord's people, uh, often we measure success in the wrong way, and we measure it by things instead of by spiritual fruit. And remember this, the only thing that you'll take and lay before the Lord Jesus Christ is, is the fruit of the Spirit, the, the things that pass the fire. And when, when you have something to lay for Him, uh, before Him, because I certainly don't think everybody will, the Bible says very clearly some will be saved so as by fire. And I believe that to mean whatever the little bit they've done for the Lord will be consumed by the flame, and they'll have nothing to lay there. And, and so we see these two men in two separate offices work together, and God blessed that greatly. You know, I believe we live in a day and an age today where that cooperative work is almost gone. Now, I'm not advocating an association like many Southern Baptists do but that you can work with other people to the betterment and to the furtherance of the gospel. And we've almost become spiritual snobs when it's come to that instead of sharing the gospel with people. But these two men chose to work together. And what a wonderful thing it would be today. You talk about a government that backs the things of the Lord. This young king did that and God blessed him greatly. Uh, a government don't have to be an evil. Now, we live under an evil one, but a government don't have to be evil. And, and, and so we find that these two men had an unusual testimony of being cooperative. Now, if you will go back to the first verse of this chapter, 2 Chronicles 24, in the first verse, the Bible begins, Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. Now, you think about a young child king and uh, there's another one uh, named Josiah that is even more spoken of that was a child king. But that would be a young man two years younger than Bella ascending to the throne. You, you know what uh, we would say about that? Oh, that's foolhardy. You're messing up as a country. You want a seven-year-old? Well, I won't, I won't even ask that. <laughs> uh, but, you know... Uh, 
That is man's idea, and it's not God's idea. What does the Bible say come, uh, of, uh, of coming to Christ? Come, as, come, in, come unto me as a little child. And you know why? Because they're humble, they lack pride, and they will follow what they're told. And if they're leaning unto God and they're listening to God, that's, what you, that's kind of what you want. That listens and follows God. And so we find this little child king ascending the throne as a seven-year-old boy, and he's going to be used of the Lord in a great way. Josiah was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 years, excuse me, 40 years in Jerusalem. Now that's a very, very long reign for that year, for those years. Number one, uh, Generally, people didn't live that long back then, but you'll see that uh, that the prophet's life was much longer. You, you know what the Bible says of long life? It's given of God. Uh, New Testament teaching, New Testament age, following the years of the flood, the Bible says 70 years and by strength, uh, three score and ten and by strength, uh, four score years. That's 80 years old. And you know what? I have to say this. I've been a lot of people past 80. You know what that is? That's the goodness of God. That's grace. Met a man when I was a boy that was 110 years old. And you know what? That, and he would attribute his long life to God. He was as sharp as a tack still. And uh, that, that is the blessing. Uh, that is the blessing of long life. But I want you to see that this reign uh, had to do with two generations. Forty years ago, I was a 12-year-old boy. Now I have children and grandchildren. That's, it impacts two generations. Have you ever thought what you're impacting? Now immediately we think of our children, right? And I hope you're impacting them, and I hope you're impacting them for the better. But you're impacting a lot more people. Uh, Brother Kenny just went to work. You're impacting some people. Every day. And you know, uh, I get a little frustrated at work and I have to try to, the best of my ability, bite this tongue because whether I like it or not, that's where God planted me and I'm impacting people. Facebook, you're impacting people. One way or the other, good or bad, if you're on there and you're posting, you're impacting one way to the good or the bad. We need to realize that. Mothers, fathers, you need to take your place. You need to stand in the spot. And you know what? Uh, you may not know how. I, I had no father figure in my life at all, except my mother-in-law when Don and I married. But you know, I did know this much. The, the Lord God, according to His Word, called that to be a very purposeful work. And I had to learn to do it if I wanted to do it right. Uh, Joash the child, this child king was used of God and I think it's interesting ladies, sisters doesn't mention his daddy Joash was seven years old when he began to reign and I'm assuming died because he ascended the throne and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was, was Zebiah of Beersheba now I want you to notice two things his mother is mentioned Zabiah or Zabiah, uh, I'm not sure it's the correct way to say that. But why is the mother even mentioned? She was not a queen. She was mentioned because she impacted her son. She was mentioned because she did the job she was supposed to do. Uh, ladies, you have a big job, be careful how you do it. Uh, and, and you know, just because you homeschool don't mean you're doing it right. We need to be very deliberate in our parents, in our parenting, excuse me. And uh, boys, that don't let y'all off the hook either. We have to think about what we're doing because what we're doing is building a generation. So this young boy who really did not have a dad to impact him, his mother took on the role and he becomes a great king. Verse 2, and Joash did that which is, was right in the sight of the Lord. 
Now, that's a powerful statement. I don't know that it could really be made about me very much of the time. I don't know that it could be made about you very much of the time. That, that's a tremendous statement. And you see it time and time again in the Scriptures, and we almost get accustomed to it. But that's a powerful testimony that you did right in the sight of the Lord. Now, that's measured two ways, people. Number one, it's measured by the law, especially in this day. It was measured by the law. And secondly... Uh, you know, this is the thing, and it was no different then than it is now. There's no law that said, John, when you're an adult man, you go up and you live on and, and you live in the wilderness three years. But he did. And how did he know to do that? I mean, that's a pretty bizarre thing to do, is it not? Well, God, God, God uh, led him in that direction. See, if you have no leading of the Holy Ghost, personal leading of the Lord, I'd make my calling and election sure. If you don't have a meaningful relationship enough with Christ and the Holy Ghost for Him to give direct leading in your life, you know what? Something's terribly wrong. And if you don't even know what I'm talking about, what's this, what's this guy talking about? Then you're really in deep trouble. And, and so we find it's not simply following the law of God. It's being attentive to what He individually tells you to do. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Now, I think it's significant that he, his testimony was specifically attached to Jehoiada. Uh, in fact, I don't know, and I don't think it says much else about this child king, but Almost the implication was that he did good as long as Jehoiada was his pastor. And when he wasn't, maybe something went wrong. I don't know. The scriptures, the best I understand, did not record that. But I think it's significant. You know what that means? That means you've got to have a pastor that will tell you the good and the bad and that will say you run well and when you're in trouble, say, listen, there's a problem. Amen. You need both, do you not? Uh, I hope you have enough intelligent par parenting skills that you uh, encourage your kids when they're doing well, but you correct them when you're wrong. Now, I have to say, here in the South, we're pretty good about uh, lighting our kids' backsides up, but when we say, you know what, you're doing really great. Thank you for what you're doing. That's just as important. You know that little hymn book? I mean, excuse me, hymn book that you have right here? Uh, you know who put that together at 17 years old? Adam. The whole thing, just cover to cover, even found a place to bind it and make it look like a real hymn book. Uh, you know, all I can say is thank you, son. You know, that's good. He needed to hear something, especially at that age. That's a vulnerable age that you did well. And, and so we see then, as the Lord's people, we need to be uh, very deliberate in that because it impacts not only the person, it impacts the person, what the, the persons that that individual impacts. You know, we need that. We need that real bad, and we need to be delivered about that in the modern day. And it came to pass after this, verse four. And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. Now, um, you know, uh, a couple things about that. Minded, to me, M-I-N-D, is your intelligence, your brain, your mind, how you think. He, he had this idea to fix up the house of God. But on the flip side, here in the South, what, when, when your mama left you with your grandparents, what was always the last thing out the door? You better mind them while I'm gone. So if Nanny said something and I didn't do it, Nanny would tell Mama, and then I'd get two witnesses. You see what I'm saying? And, and you know what that means? That's why we need to be obedient to the leading of the Lord. He might do ask you to do something that's bizarre to you, but what you do is to be obedient to it. If it's something as simple as giving a glass of water to a prophet, or it's something as complex as starting a mission site,
somewhere, be obedient unto the things of the Lord. That, that's what I think we see most missing in the modern age is individuals be, not being obedient to the Word of God and certainly not being obedient to His personal plan for your personal life. So he was minded to fix up the house of the Lord. You know, that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 place to take in the uh, uh, in the work of the Lord. It'll wear you out. It, it'll make you tired. Uh, I've drug you all through the muck at times. That old building down at Cumberland City, the old uh, Black Methodist Church, I know y'all love me for help, getting for helping me. To, I made you help to fix that thing up for a week-long meeting. And then nothing developed out of it. Uh, but you know what? I was minded to do that. Very, very, very important to be obedient. If I had to sweep every floor of it myself, that was the thing to do. And we sometimes forget that, do we not? What about Dresden? We spent a lot of money down there. That old nasty storefront. You know what? I was minded to do that, so it was very important that I be obedient to that. He don't give us... He don't plant in us a burdens without a reason. He said, well, Brother Larry, they did, nothing came of it. Maybe it taught me obedience. Maybe it taught y'all what mission work's about. I don't, know, I don't know what the mind of God was, but I do know this. I was minded to do so, and it's very, very important when you're minded to do something for the Lord that you get it done. Uh, and, and so we find that he was, uh, he was very much advocating the fixing up, the, the rebuilding, to make the Lord's house useful and nice again. Verse 5, And he gathered together the priests, and that was usually one from each, uh, excuse me, and he gathered together the priest and the Levites. Now the priest uh, did the work in the house of God. The Levitical tribe was the ones that uh, that were in that had the, their their inheritance was to live off the house of God, and he got them together. Now this is what I found among preaching men: they're not always minded to do the work of the God, the work of the work of God either. Just because they have pastor or preacher at the end of their name doesn't mean that they're minded to do the work of God. And further still, it doesn't mind, it mean, even mean they're, that they found the will of God for their life. Listen, that's not written in the pages of that dear book. That's something individual. That's something that you have to, uh, that you get by uh, fasting and praying. It doesn't come to you like a lightning bolt. Uh, and, and so we find. Even though these tri this tribe was set apart for the use of God, they weren't always useful for God. And you know what? The elect, the elect, the elect of all the ages are set aside for the use of God, but we're not always useful to God. Do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> what did... Uh, 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 Samuel's mother say? Concerning her only son at the time, I'll lend him to the Lord all the days of his life. Mm -hmm. Now, what does lend mean? I have uh, two, three dollars. I say I'm gonna lend that to Kenny. What is the what is the indications of that statement? Did I give it? All right, you pay me back. I didn't give it to him. I lent it to him. So she was saying he's mine. And I'm letting you use it. You know, that's a whole lot harder than giving something away. Because if you see it abused, if you see it mistreated, in any way, you have to watch that. You, you have to watch the endurance of that. And, and so we find often we do not follow through. We're just like the Levitical tribe. We're not as obedient as we ought to be. And so... Uh, verse 5 says, He, meaning Josa, uh, uh, Joash, and he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out into the cities of Judah, gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year, and see that ye hasten the matter, howbeit the Levites hastened it, uh, hastened it not. Uh, good Baptist people, right? They, uh, they said, get up there. 
Get you some go to all the areas. That's one of the door to door gatherings. And get some money so we can fix this place up. Now, you may or may not have a nice building. That's not the emphasis of this scripture, really. The emphasis is this giving to the Lord. Now, listen, if you had enough to eat this morning, be very, very thankful. Donna says I use my cereal example too much, so this morning Donna fixed me a nice egg and a piece of toast, and it, it, it was really good. I, I had something to eat. I can't fuss, can I? I? I can't say a thing about it. And so we, the same way, if He's given to us, certainly we should have the have the love of God about us to give back, right? There, there, there's not one of us that's gone hungry. There's not one of us that didn't have a, a warm place to sleep last night. And yet, still, often, just like these people, we don't do anything. We don't get on it. Now, in addition to the money, because of well, Brother Larry, don't get upset. I paid my tithe. Well, good for you. What else should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you tithe on your time, like you tithe on your money, you need to serve the Lord about twenty, uh, about eighteen hours every week, and doing something in the in His name. We don't tithe on our time, do we? Really? Uh, we uh, we may try, but we often don't get it done. Do we? But I remember, I think like one hundred eighty-six hours in a week, so that means over eighteen hours if we tithe on our time, right? And so we uh, we need to be mindful of that, do we not? Right. Um, we need we need to give and not give begrudgingly. You know, we when you want to do that uh, point one zero times the amount of money you make and get your tithe number all together and and you flip flop because you've done that. You know, the best thing to do is just give. Uh, don't count pennies with God; you'll never get anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, and so we see then uh, as the Lord that this young man, very wise for his age, says we need to get this done and the people need to finance it. Verse 6, And the king called for Jehoiada, the chief, the chief priest, and said unto him, Why hast not thou required the Levites to bring in and out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, and the, the, according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness? Now, I want you to notice two things. He, he made uh, Jehoiada responsible. You know, whether I want to or not, and y'all are a wonderful church uh, to work with, and you never ride me or anything, but you know what? You do need to hold me accountable. You need to say, hey, you know what? You're messing up. You know, if you read the letters of Paul, he held them accountable. Um, well, uh, and, and John did too. Uh, read, uh, what is it, Third John? Hey, he says... These people are not what they appear to be. Uh, they're compromisers. Those people were essentially compromisers. Whatever was going on, they were fine with. And, he, and so <laughs> we need to understand and know accountability. If anything has been lost in the 52 years I've lived, it's being accountable for your own actions. I, I remember, and I guess maybe... Uh, I don't know, I was either in high school or early years of my college. The first time I said, I mean, I heard this. Well, he can't help it. What? He can't help it. What do you mean? And it wasn't somebody with an eat like Joey. And you know what? What I found working with people like Joey all my life, they're pretty deliberate too. You know, if you do something, you're responsible for it, right? If you take in and go into a quick market and blow somebody's head off, you're responsible. And it don't matter how your mother and daddy righted you as a child, you're still responsible for what you have done. Jehoiada was responsible even though he blamed the others. 
Uh, that's a big re uh, responsibility, isn't it, pre isn't it, preaching men? You're responsible. You know what? Uh, and, and it's good that men be evaluated and, and uh, ordained by churches. I believe that's what the Scriptures teach. But at the end of the day, you're responsible. You, you'll give an answer for what you presented as God's Word, not anybody else. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that it's not, we live in a day of pass the buck, so be very, very cautious that you don't fall into that, that you don't become part of that. Then notice uh, in verse 7, For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also all the dedicated things, the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow upon Balaam. Now, I want you uh, to notice a couple of things. First of all, that the woman down at the house of at the line was a very, very wicked, wicked woman. And she impacted the house of God. She worked against the house of God. Uh, and, and if you read it, especially in, in Moses and uh, the specifics of the temple uh, that David laid out and how it was to be done, even in the wilderness tabernacle, those things were costly and expensive. And she had just thrown them down to Balaam's temple. You know what? When you, when you quit serving the Lord, you're doing the exact same thing. And listen, you're a lot, lot more costly than a gold cherub. You cost the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to serve Him. And any time that we don't, and, and worse still, people that serve the Lord, and we've all seen this, seemingly to stand for the, uh, for the Word of God, and all of a sudden they do just a 180 and head off in the other direction, denied they ever believed it to start with. That, that's what Athaliah did in reality in selling the gold in selling the pieces that was about the ornaments she was trashing it and you know way too quickly we trash ourselves do we not we we throw ourselves out with the bath water and one thing and listen it don't have to be conscious like oh i know what i'm gonna do today i'm gonna throw my testimony under the bus no it can make it be a decision that you're making spark in the spark of a moment and it's gone for the rest of your life. Right. And so we have to be very containing in these vessels. And, and so I want you to see that uh, the child king held, uh, held him responsible because he had told him to do it. Verse 8, notice the king had to do this. And at the king's command they made a chest and set it without at the gate of the house of the Lord. Now, uh, that, uh, that, if you, you know, you've all been to churches just like me, they either had a tie box up here or like the Methodists, they passed the plate and all that goes with that. You know, all that is is to brag about yourself. And if you'll find, if you'll find the history in this little box that Joash begins, it's still there in the days of Malachi. Uh, it's still at, at the end of the Old Testament. It's still at the back of the temple. And uh, that's how tithes should be received. And uh, so since the priest wouldn't, the leader did. Isn't that a wonderful thing that, uh, boys, when we preachers don't do it, God will. When, when we are not faithful to what God has given us to do, God makes a way. So when nobody else would do it, Joash stood, stood up to the plate, put a little box back there at the temple, and actually this one in that day uh, was on the outside of the building, the outside of the temple, and, uh, and he said, we'll do it this way. God's always got a plan. You know what? He don't need you for nothing. He does it for his own glory and honor. Amen. If he can use Balaam's house and he can use rocks to cry out to his own praise, he don't need that, 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 that That'll put you down there right where you belong, right? And, and, and so we see that Joash does what God's men wouldn't. He's the leader he's supposed to be. He's the leader of uh, 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 the example to the people there about him. 
Verse 9. And he made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring to the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. Now, I want you to notice a couple of different things. First of all, he got the job done, and then he advocated it, he preached it, he said it before the people, and he makes a very old requirement of them, and that's you give what, you, what your fathers did to Moses. Now, if you'll, you'll follow that history, what had happened the night before they made their exit from Egypt, God moved in a great way, and they went down, and they'd been seeing them, them Egyptian women's houses for years and years, and said, uh, and seen their gold vessels, and seen their brass vessels, and seen their pearls, and, and God gave them great glory, and they had the courage to do it, and they went back to where they used to clean and say, man, I love that chandelier. What do you want it? Here it is. All over the nation of Egypt that night. And they left there with the items to give unto God. See, He'll provide what He needs. That obedience, that giving, is glory to God, not to you. That's why that box is a whole lot better than passing the plate. And, and, and so we see that they were obedient to this. You know what? And we'll read in a minute. Not only were they were obedient, they were eager to do it. I ask you, uh, I ask you this morning: Are you eager to serve the Lord? Are you eager to pay your tithe? Are you eager to go up and above what He has blessed you with and give to Him first? That's where we need to be. And you know what? He'll do that sometimes. He'll call you to the point that He wants you to give until it hurts. And you know, you don't know why. Yesterday when I wrecked the truck and I was trying to grab it and then it drug me across the parking lot. You know, it, it's so amazing what your mind thinks about in just a split second. And I thought, you know, it'd be smart to let go. <laughs> and I did. We don't always make the best decisions, do we? And so you have to be deliberate about it. You have to be, um, it has to be a decisional thing. Some great people don't like to make, don't like to give any credits to decision, do they? But listen, how you serve him is all about decision. You can't decide to be his, but if you're his, you can decide if you're going to serve him or if you're not. And, and so we find that he makes this proclamation. He says, "This is how it's going to be." He puts the box in place. He makes the proclamation. Notice the response, and all the princes. And all the people rejoiced. If I said, all right, everybody, we haven't, we haven't tried Dixon yet. We're going to go down to Dixon and rent a storefront. Would you go, woo, thank you, Larry. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> right? I feel both ways, right? <laughs> uh, but the very people that God, the Levitical priest, thought they were going to get the, get the hump from, get the, the backlash. Man, they began to rejoice. You know, if you're in God's will this morning and He gives you something to do or your pastor requests something of you, you'll rejoice when you do it. Now, if you're not in the will of God and you're in a, hot, in a hard spot in your life, um, it'll make you mad. It'll, it'll make you... Uh, kind of gruff your feathers a little bit, and uh, but you may do it anyway, but listen, you might as well just set the house. Hey, if you're not doing it with a heart of love, and you're not doing it because you love the Lord, and you're not excited about what God is doing in your life, just set up the house. Because there's nothing, uh, there's nothing good that can come from a halfway service. But these people were not minded that way at all. They were joyous. They were glad. And notice what they did. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until it was made an end. Now the best I understand what that means, they did it until it was full. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Our kind of box has never been full. No, our, our monetary system here in the States is a little bit different. But you get the idea. And you know what? God will endlessly bless whatever we do. <clears throat> How many churches with a handful of people had the money on, on hand to do what we do? 
I would say few and far between. And you know why I think it's because people give with a heart of love. I don't think there's uh, a person here that gives their tithe tithes like they pay the light bill. Oh man, I hate CMC. Right to check out, man. Click the mouse. All right. That's where we need to be, is it not? We need to do it with faith and love. And oh man, what he's done for me, how could I possibly deny him? And, uh, and, and give it with a heart of love. And that's what these people did. So, uh, Je uh, Joash declared it, the people responded, the box was full. Now notice what happens. Now it came to pass that at that time, at, at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, and uh, the king's scribe and the high priest officer came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to the place again. Now, you're talking about a precursor to Baptist people. There they go. Uh, they got all that thing chucked full, and, and instead of giving up on it, they thought it back there and said, well, we'll run her again and, and see what happens. And you know what happens? It's full again, and it's full again, and it's full again, and they do this great and wonderful work with no debt whatsoever. That's the God we serve. That's the God of the Bible. Listen, we don't need to be stressed in the day and that age which we live about money. You know what? You may not have that much nice things. You may be on a steep hill in a double wide like me, but you know what? It rained yesterday, not the day before yesterday, and I slept like a baby. I didn't get one sprinkle in my face. You know what? God's been good. And this place ought to be, if we don't have a meeting house, it ought to be just as nice as our house as we get home to. You know, I've seen people, and there's nothing wrong with it, <laughs> meeting shacks, but they live in a three bedroom brick. That ought not to be so. It, it, it ought to be just as nice. You don't have one. Give glory to God with it. E every, every possibility, everything uh, that we can do, we can give glory to God with, so it might as well be within the house of God as well. And notice at the end of that verse in uh, verse 11, and they gathered money in abundance. Verse 12, and the king, and, and the king Jehoiada gave it so, so and gave it to much, such as the, the, and the king, and the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the houses of the house of the Lord and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, so the workmen wrought and the work was perfected by them, and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. What a wonderful thing. Now I ask you, and you ought to answer this for yourself, what have you done to strengthen the house of the Lord? Now we have a nice building, blessed be the name of the Lord, but you know what? This is not the church in Dover. All you that are truly members here at the church of Do at Dover, you're the ones that's involved. What have you done to strengthen it? Now, by that text, I'll have to understand this, and you've seen it too, probably more than me. If the church can be strengthened, Oh, it certainly can be weakened. You know why you examine people when they come to a church? They can do one or two things. They can make it better or they make it a whole lot worse. But that's really what it's about. Uh, and that's in God's hand, you know. I mean, I understand there's governments placed in the church and the way we do things is fine, but the Bible says God's placed some in the church. But listen, you're responsible for how it turns out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, which church letter was it? He said, I know where Satan's seat is. <laughs> in, in the Revelation. You know what? He got in there somehow, didn't he? And once they voted on him, <laughs> you know, this is the sad truth. They probably did. They probably did. Because he don't come with a pointed tail and horns on his head, does he? He comes with silver tongues and good-looking people. And, and so we see then that as they're doing this great and wonderful work, 
that uh, God blesses it immensely. Things are strengthened because of the decision of one individual, their pastor, their king, and God blessed it greatly. Verse 14, and when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, before the king and Jehoiada, wherefore were made of vessels of the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister, to offer withal the spoons, the vessels of gold and silver, and they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord, and uh, of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. Now, I want you to see it makes this note about Jehoiada. Also, they, they took part of the month, they took part of the items and they created the missing vessels. You know what? I firmly believe there can be missing vessels in the church, don't you? Uh, you have to be careful about that. Now, if you get a vessel, a member, you better be sure God put them there. Uh, you better be certain of that. But they're useful, are they not? So all the days of Jehoiada's life, while he was while he was in the priest office, those those vessels were used appropriately. You used your vessels appropriately this week. Only you can answer that for me. Um, we live in a day and age where it takes almost a job and a half to keep your family going. But you know what? That's no excuse. What did you do this week? This offering continually in the Old Testament, and if you know your Bible, it was an ongoing thing every day. There was new sins, there were new sacrifices, right? It's tied how we are to serve. It's a never-ending thing from the day that He saves you to you go out in eternity. You keep serving. And you keep serving Him faithfully. You keep serving it not as it's a burden, but though, as though it was a pleasure, as though it was uh, something that you would be glad and happy to do. That's how we, <laughs> that's how we are to uh, serve our King. Verse fifteen. Uh, in verse uh, fifteen, we had already read it in our text. But Jehoiada waxed old. Now, having heard his testimony and heard now the goodness that God brought through him, the fact that he is getting old is now much more significant because, listen, you can have all the desire that you want, but when you're old, you just can't do what you once did. You may want to, you may have that, uh, the vim and the vigor, but listen, there's only, there's only so much a 53-year-old body can get out. There's only so much an 82-year-old body can do. And you know what? Serving while you're young. I've told that since Jared was 19. <laughs> and I still tell it to you today, brother. Uh, serving while you're young. Use, use that youth. Uh, but what did the wisest man that ever lived said in Ecclesiastes? Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Uh, when the hard times cometh not. Dear friend, they're coming. Uh, but th that's just part of life. Uh, I'm not saying I, I'm mad about it, but I am telling you the reality of it. They're coming. So uh, serve him uh, while you have the vim and the vigor to do so. And uh, his aging now is significant because he's slowing down. He's not as effective as he used to be. And, and, and when you have a poor leader... What's the natural result? People are not going to do. You know what? When people give 110%, two things. Number one, you let them know they're appreciated. And number two, keep your eyes on them. That's, that's how you keep people on the ball. To avoid it could no longer do either. Uh, and it impacted the service of the Lord. You know what? Uh, we, we need to be cautious about that, do we not? We need to be significantly serving the Lord. Bye. And make other people accountable. Donna makes me accountable, I'll make her accountable. That's not because we don't like each other, that's just how, that's just how you do it. <laughs> we raised up a generation. You, you know, I, I've, I've quoted that verse so much down through the years, and there rose up a Pharaoh that knew not God. Uh, we rose up a generation like that. You, you young people, Jared, 
I'll throw you in there because I still love you. Uh, y'all, y'all live a different. Y'all live in a different generation than I do. Y'all live in a different time. It, it's crazy when I look at it. Sir, look, look, look under what He has given you individually to do. So He's old now. He can't do what He once did. But Joel waxed old and was full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings. Not, not because he was a king, but because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. Now if you read the rest of that, you see that... <laughs> Things began to go downhill again with the next priest and the next king. And only those in the story of people's lives. Um, so I ask you, how faithful are you? I, I can't answer that for you. You know, used to when I was a young man, being faithful was showing up for services. That's not being faithful, that's your reasonable service. Yeah. Faithful is what you're doing. Faithful is when you speak the name of Christ. Faithful is when you get the bad news and by prayer you hang on anyway. You know, uh, Brother Titus, now home to be with the Lord. So glad he's no longer suffering. Uh, I see him tie a knot in and hang on by the mercy and grace of God. I never saw him one time doubt the plan of God in his life. And when you are eat up with cancer, boy, that's significant. To, to understand a testimony like that, the only thing I can say is you have to experience cancer. <clears throat> and, then, and then when you do, you say, man, I don't, I, I, it was just by the grace of God he did it. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how have you been doing? At least the best we know right now, none of us have cancer. Uh, how you been doing with that? How you, how you been feeling with that? Uh, are, are you serving him like you should? Uh, when you die, where are you going to where are you going to be buried? Now a lot of us uh, think of that like out here by the church building, the pot next door. But that's what I'm talking about. What are they going to say about you when you're done? What's your testimony going to leave behind? How did he get that status that he was buried with the kings? Is because how he served the Lord. Mm. How, how are you going to get that status? Now, uh, I think that's highly important to know where you're at. And only you can answer that. Mm.